final value here at Beacon Church, which is courageous in mission. I know you're really excited about that one, aren't you? Courageous, courageous, come on. We're just in mission this morning. Uh, we have a number of technical difficulties, and one of them has just realized um, my printer has not printed out the sermon notes properly. So I'm going to be going from memory and notes on my phone. So bear with me a little bit this morning. Uh, but the first question I want to ask, well, let me just pray before I do that. Let me pray. Lord Jesus Christ, um, all of us here have had lots of experiences this week, but we've come right now to sit at your feet and to hear from you, Jesus, what you want to talk to us about. Help our hearts to be open to hearing from you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Courageous mission. How many of us here feel courageous about mission? How many? No? It's a difficult thing, isn't it? Like, great, I want to go out there. You want to do it, don't you? You want to do that sort of thing, but there is something about it that you know is going to take some a level of courage. And it's not easy, is it? When you think about that, think about, oh no, oh no. Can we think of maybe talk about something else, loving other people? Courageous in mission. But it's actually essential for the church. It's so important that we do that. Um, a theologian, I'm going to be pointing at Helen a lot today. It's in a good way, but Helen's going to be putting on slides this morning. Maybe, hopefully, yeah. Uh, as a Christian, a uh, theologian called Bruner, and he says, the church exists for mission as a fire exists for burning. Where there is no mission, there is no church. And that's what we look at this morning. We're going to realize that actually that's quite dem demonstrably true for our church in this country, actually, right now. Historically, that's been the case. When the church has forgotten about the mission, the church has declined. Now, it might not be right in this today. You know, you can start to forget about mission, forget about our responsibility to tell people about the gospel. But over the course of time, from one generation and then to the next, you'll see a decline in church growth. And not, not just yet. No, no, not just yet. A decline in church growth in churches. So it's an essential part of what we do as church. It's actually the very beginning of church. It's why we come together. So, uh, first of all, I want to just talk a bit about how um, a church, what is the mission of the church? You know, what is that exactly? Okay, so if you like to open up your Bibles to uh, Matthew 28. Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. From verse 18, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Now this is a command that's given to the church before the new covenant church actually exists. So even before this gathering thing that we're doing right now actually happens, Jesus had already given foundational command for why we're doing everything. And he says, and this is the encouraging part, that all authority has been given to him. So while he's sitting on his throne right now, ruling and reigning, he's ruling and reigning over all the forces of darkness and of all the governments and authorities on earth. We might not see that, and it doesn't always look like Jesus is doing it, but he is right now. We need to have faith in that first before we do anything. We're going to come back to that later. But I want us to concentrate on three things that he says here. The first thing he says is he says, go! Not stay, but go! Get out there! You know the word mission is not in the Bible, right? It's not in the Bible, can't find it. Doesn't, doesn't exist anywhere. It's a Latin word for people that didn't want to use the word. The Greek word is apostle. That's a long story, I won't go into it, but they use the word mission. And it basically, the Greek word is go. Be sent. Get out there. Get gone. Get it. Don't be here. Go out there. Go for them. Before the church was even a thing, before this thing that we're doing right now, gathering together, Jesus didn't say gather. He said go. Get out there. The reason why we're gathering together is because it's really hard to go. And we need each other. And we need to come together to be encouraged by the Lord. In a moment, not long time after the service is over, you're going to be sent out to go. That's what you're doing this week. 
But the church, when it forgets that, forgets that part of the whole message, it doesn't exist. There's no reason for it. The second thing that Jesus looks at, uh, make, uh, uh, points out, he says, it doesn't say make converts in the verse, it says make disciples. Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Now, I've known many people that have been baptized and come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And some of them have gone on in their faith. Some of them haven't. Some of them made a profession of faith. But I think on this, uh, this wooden pulpit, back at the weekend, I, live, I don't know where they are in their faith now. So over the course of time, all disciples become converts. And when we disciple people, we teach them. We teach them to observe everything the Lord commanded. Jesus says, go. And then he says, teach them. He doesn't say, just convert them or baptize them and leave them and move on. He says, we have to carry on that process of teaching one another and teaching disciples. When the church doesn't do that, it declines. And the last thing I want you to look at, and then we're going to look at it, but we're going to look at some, uh, how it's worked out in our culture. The last thing I want you to look at is that right at the end of verse 20, he says the word you. And just so you know, this is one of my bugbears. In the English language, the word you has only got one way of using you. It's just you. But in Greek, it's got two ways. And both those ways means two different things. One is singular. That means just for an individual. And the other way is plural. That means for a group of people. And here right now is plural. So Jesus commanded everybody together to go make disciples. You ever heard the phrase, um, it takes a child, it takes a, no, I'm going to get wrong now. <laughs> Have you ever heard the phrase that I'm going to get wrong? Uh, it takes a community to raise a child, something like that. It takes a village, thank you. It takes a village to raise a child. It takes a church to make disciples. Uh, just as Ruth said, it doesn't just take the evangelist. In fact, in my opinion, I know some good friends who are evangelists, and they're wonderful people, lovely, godly people, but... Uh, um, they have a sp three very specific skill sets on one level, and maybe perhaps not so in other places. Just like me, perhaps a teacher, um, very sp specific skill set, not so good in other areas. You know, we we'll all have different skill sets, and actually, it's the whole church community that makes disciples. And when the church forgets that, the church declines. So these, this is the pivotal form moment of the church. The church needs to hold on to this. The Lord God is ruling and reigning on high. He's telling you to go. He says, I want you to teach people to observe my commands. You've got to keep those commands. And we're going to do it together. But it's scary, isn't it? Isn't it scary? Isn't it worrying? How can we do that? How can a little bit of Beacon Church do anything like that? Okay, I just want you to look at some of the things that are going on uh, right now in the church today. And we're just going to see how people, how churches feeling this fear have actually gone either one way or another. They've either not taught properly or they've become entrenched and hidden away. Let's have a look at the first slide coming here. Now you're not going to see much of this. I'm trying to get on the picture, on um, the page as best I possibly can. There's some detail there. Yeah, there we go. Can you, everybody see that's really exciting slides now, everybody. Just getting really exciting graphs, Excel spreadsheets. Okay, can you see the red guys up there and the blue guys? Can you see them? The blue guys, the churches that decline. Now, I want to preface this by saying there are a lot of godly, hardworking, evangelical churches in these blue denominations that are actually growing. But as a whole, those, church, those denominations are declining. And the ones in red, they are growing. So the ones in red are growing, ones in blue are declining. You can see um, uh, it's a little bit, uh, the, the blue ones are the Free Church of Scotland and Seventh day Adventists. The reason why they're blue is because they're pre 1900 churches. They're actually really old churches that are still growing. But all the other old churches are declining, and they're going to decline so much that this century they will be wiped out. That's classic churches, man, like the Wesleyan Church. John Wesley's Methodist Church is declining so rapidly that over the next 10, 15 years, there'll be nobody else left to really properly run it. And even the Baptist Union that we're affiliated with is actually is declining as well. By 2080, it's going to be no more. And then you've got these other churches in red. So I want to just discuss what's happening here. 
And the first thing you remember what Jesus said, go and teach the disciples. Go and make disciples around the world. Teach them to observe everything I commanded you. Well, the ones in red have certain things in common that they hold to about their apostolic teaching, and the ones in blue do not. The ones in red, you have churches that uh, uh, women preach at, you have churches that baptize infants, you have churches that disagree with each other. They don't always hold to the same doctrine, but there are some basic fundamentals that they hold to. Every single one of those in red hold to the idea of the traditional meaning of marriage. All the ones that are growing, sorry, I should say, including the Free Church of Scotland. All of them hold to that view. The traditional meaning of marriage between a man and a woman. The traditional meaning of what we might call today of sexuality. They all hold to that in some form or another. Every single one of these other denominations that are in decline does. In some form or another, they've chosen to abandon that. And it's really interesting that the ones that are least in decline have the least amount of uh, care towards sexuality, uh, biblical sexuality. So, uh, for example, at the Baptist Union, individual churches are allowed to decide whether they should marry same-sex couples. So it's not so bad, maybe you want to say, but in the Welsh Presbyterian and also the Wesleyan churches, they allow people to, ministers to be in uh, same-sex relationships, and everything in, in that way. And you see how rapidly they're declining? But all the red are holding to that one particular truth. Why is that? They're holding to the apostolic teaching. The commands that the Lord Jesus Christ has given us in the church, they're holding to that. And those churches are not in decline, they're growing. But there's one other thing they're doing, which the other, the blue churches tended not to historically, and that was to go. To get out there. These red churches tend to be more modern churches, newer churches, I should say, and they're doing a lot of evangelism, and they were doing it a long time ago. For one reason or another, the more traditional churches didn't do so much of that. They stayed more entrenched in their traditions, in their particular spaces and places, in their own uh, community churches. I'm not, don't get me wrong, that's not a bad thing, but if that's all you're doing in a generation's time, you'll be wiped out. Now, the, the man who made this graph and did the studies, he was trying to discern whether, uh, can a church just have children? You know, just lots of babies, and over a period of time, can that church grow? And what he discovered was it won't. It will still decline. You have to have baptisms. You have to bring in new converts. You can't just stay in your tradition. You have to constantly believe that you have to go out there in the world and preach the gospel. It is the only way that the church will grow. If you don't do that now, in a generation's time, the church will decline. There's two things there. Holding on to the apostolic teaching and going out. Now, in my experience, that's really hard. I don't blame some of those blue churches. I've got friends of mine who have a different sexuality, and, and it's difficult. It's really hard. I find it quite painful. I've cried tears. Maybe I want to water things down a little bit. It's, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an evangelist on an estate, and I feel like I need the courage to go out there and proclaim the gospel. It's really hard. Uh, and I want to be entrenched. When I was at Bible college, my Bible college is at what you might call a very conservative college, yeah? Um, we would often meet together and we would go and have lunch together, a small like, tutor group. And one day, uh, somebody decided to go and have a, a coffee for lunch at a, um, what we call an arts college. It was like they did, um, they, they did all sorts of things. It was an arts college and they did, uh, uh, they did acting and all sorts of things there. And I thought it was a really great idea. Let's go down and have a coffee there and set as a group and uh, we just meet up once a week and do that. And then, and we went there, it was great, we see lots of kids from the college and hanging out, and it was great. I thought it was a really good opportunity. Maybe, just maybe, we could chat to some of those kids while we're there. The next week, however, I learned that we decided not to meet there any longer, and I wasn't sure why somebody else made the decision. I don't want to say any names. But then I overheard a conversation. I overheard a conversation, there's a, a, a great guy, I love him very much, but I had this conversation and he was saying things about those kids. 
and then it, he was using words like woke and LGBTQT, and he was using it in a way where he'd rather, like, not in a good way. Like, he'd rather not be there and have his coffee amongst those people. Now, he might have had good, some, in some way, some level of good teaching, but what he wasn't doing was going. Our job as a church is to go directly to those people, those young people, who are losing their faith or wandering away, and at the same time hold on to that teaching. And I can tell you, it's very hard to do. It's difficult, it's not easy. When I worked uh, my last job, and I'm getting, because it's on video, I'm not gonna say too much, I'm just speaking generally. In my last job, there was a friend of mine who I loved very, very much, and she had a girlfriend. And we were very, I, I really hope we were very close. I think, I think that today that she would still have a lot of respect for me. But she, you know, when you're close to someone like that, and you haven't really had that conversation about your faith so much, but they sort of know that you know, and there's a tension between you, and you find it really hard to discuss. Um, and sadly, one day, I was speaking to a friend about what I believe uh, through a text message, and this friend showed her what I believe. And I remember going in the next day to work, I remember everybody at work not speaking to me. Everybody blankly. And I know why, it's really hard, man. They didn't know what they didn't know whether it should be on the side of their side or my side, or there should be any sides. It was just a really awkward situation. And she didn't speak to me. And I went home that day and I cried. I went home that day and I cried, man. It's really hard to keep the mission of Jesus Christ. I'm searching desperately for people to come to know the faith. I'm holding on to that teaching that the Lord said. He said, Go, it will work out. These are the churches that are doing it and they're breaking their way and the churches that don't decline. So I imagine that all of us will feel like we need to be encouraged. Well, let me encourage you a little bit further by showing a group of people that have the same problem as we do and with mission. Um, uh, Helen, would you like to show the next slide, please? Uh, this group of people, uh, the Bible calls the disciples. Have anybody heard of the disciples, the apostles of Jesus Christ? You heard those guys? Okay, this is the disciples after Jesus Christ was crucified. And you can read on your screen, it says, On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked, a fear of the Jewish leaders at the time. They're scared, they're worried, they're frightened, and they're afraid. What I want to show you right now is that all those things, those feelings that we have when we do mission are quite normal and okay. You can feel those feelings. You're not meant to be like an Alex. Remember Alex Harris? He was really annoying. I used to go on walks with him and he would just walk past people and he would just like start a conversation with them in order to segue to Jesus immediately. I was not quite like that, but I really encouraged, I want him to do it, but I'm not quite like that myself. You don't have to be like that. We can just be a normal, everyday disciple that's in living with a life of nervousness and fear when you speak to other people. Can I have the next one? Yeah. Who's this? Paul. Paul the Apostle of Zelda, he knows the Bibles. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. And he's talking to the Corinthian church. And the Corinthian church was a pretty messed up church. Now it wasn't a group of special people. They were doing all sorts of crazy stuff. They were all over the place. And the apostle Paul, Paul the apostle, who wrote most of the epistles in the New Testament, came to them with weakness and trembling and fear. Does anyone else feel fear sometimes when you're coming to someone? Some trembling going on in your belly when you want to speak about Jesus. And weakness, feeling like, I, I don't even know what to say to anybody. The Apostle Paul. That's how he describes himself. Other people, when they looked at Paul, like Luke and his account in the book of Acts, he would report that Paul had boldness when you looked at him. But Paul inside feels fear and nervous. You ever try to preach to a grumpy, uh, I say grumpy then? If it's hard to preach to a group of people, 
you know how what it feels like in your belly. It's like, oh my God. And some people have come up to you afterwards. That was really good. But you're like, oh, I'm dying inside, man. I was dying. Yeah. Have you ever tried to do anything for the Lord Jesus and feel sick and worried and scared and frightened? You have to step out of faith and you don't know what's going on. <clears throat> but outside, it just looks like you're trying your best for Jesus. Well, this is it, church. This is where our courage is. You can be encouraged. The apostles themselves, the disciples themselves felt the same way. It is hard to go out and do the mission of God. It is really hard in your life. It is okay that you feel this way. But there is hope, yes? We don't want to live in this space for all life. We're not going to be, you know, the great evangelists like my friend John Taylor, who's just a little bit mental. It's okay. He's got a special gift. The rest of us, we're going to go places, weakness and fear and trembling. But where does our courage come from? So our courage comes from, and you can look this up in your Bible, it's going to be on your screen, but if you want to turn to Acts chapter 1, verse 8 for me, please. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. I'll write it down, and you can look at it a little bit. Oh, yeah, sorry, that was it. And the next one after that, yeah, that was the answer one. Yes, okay, it does. Uh, we will we'll look at Acts chapter 8, verse 4, and then I'll get to that. So in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, uh, Jesus goes to his disciples, and the disciples are asking him, are you going to restore the kingdom of heaven? That's basically, can you make it all good again? I know that we can all be at live in peace, and it would be great. And Jesus says, not yet. And so in verse 8, he says to them, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus Christ our Lord knows that it's going to be difficult to have that courage. He knew that back all the way in Matthew 28, when he called his disciples to him on that mountaintop. And he looked at them and said, well, I'm going to give you this mission. Here's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to go. Go and make disciples among the nations. He knew it was going to be hard. He hasn't left us alone. And instead, he's going to give us what? What is he going to give us? He's going to give us the Holy Spirit. So you don't have to do it alone. You might be scared. You might be frightened. But we're going to have the Holy Spirit. And we see this pattern replicated throughout the book of Acts. First of all, with Peter, this cowardly man who hid from the religious leaders of his day. When the Holy Spirit comes upon him, he's boldly proclaiming outside in a bit of a crazy way. And then later on in verse 4, Peter is gathered together with all the church. And do you know what they did? They prayed. They prayed that God would give them the boldness to have the courage to go out and do it again. And then we have this guy, the Apostle Paul himself. And you know what he's doing? He's asking for prayer. He's an apostle asking for prayer so that he will proclaim the gospel fearlessly. He can't do this job of being courageous in mission without having faith that God will work in that very moment. You can't do it. Weakness and trembling is where we go into those spaces. But in those spaces we go, and we go trusting in the Holy Spirit that he will work through our lives. Just like Peter and just like Paul. And this is true for the Beacon Church today. Now, how does that look like? How do you go into spaces like that? So, uh, a few years ago, I was hanging out with some friends of mine, uh, and um, I was I came I, I kind, of, kind of worked this out at some point. I think I read Acts or something like that, and I worked out that the apostles themselves, strangely enough, instead of being just energized in that one moment by the Holy Spirit and went out into the world preaching and teaching the gospel. They constantly pray for more boldness. They constantly pray that they'll be helped to tell people about Jesus. So I went out with friends on a Sunday night. It's not always the greatest night of the week to go out partying, but I was going out with some friends to a pub, and we hung out, and it was, a, it was the worst karaoke bar I've ever been to in my life. It was just, the, you know, like not even good karaoke, just like the worst possible ear-scratching karaoke you can imagine. And it was loud. And I can, you know, like a loud place, you just can't have a proper conversation. It was just awkward. It was just weird. And we weren't really getting on with each, like, just normal conversation. It was really hard. But we all decided we'd be there, so we're there, right? And in the middle 
above all that, I don't know why it came across my mind, but I decided I was going to put this into practice. A group of friends were here. I think it was just the, the urgency I felt like. I have these friends, none of them are Christians. And as a Christian and somebody trained for ministry, I'm not telling them about Jesus at all. They know I'm their friend, but I'm not really speaking to them about Jesus in any way. I haven't made a witness yet. And there's just something in me that felt like I needed to do that. Okay, I need to go in and do that. That's something I gotta do. So I prayed in my head. They didn't know that. Just me in my head, Ian to Jesus. And in that moment, I prayed, Lord, just like these dudes here in your Bible, will you give me boldness? I wasn't quite sure what boldness meant. I think I realize now, boldness just means clarity. Not a big sharp, a big loud voice, just clarity. Give me clarity, Lord. Give me boldness in a karaoke bar. And I was waiting for just the right moment, and I can't remember exactly what the situation was, but somebody else brought up something that segued into me saying, oh, and Jesus, Jesus wants you to think about this. And out of my mouth, you know, out of my mouth, some words that I wasn't even expecting just came out with great clarity. It was a weird moment, and it was a bit awkward because everybody just sort of stopped. And they listened. I remember in this karaoke bar, they were all like looking at me, and they started having a conversation about Jesus and the gospel. One friend didn't like it. He started to push back a bit. I can even sense that he was a little bit angry. Wasn't sure why, don't know, just a bit angry. Another friend chimed in and said, yeah, I agree, which was a bit of a surprise to me. I didn't know where she was at, but apparently she agreed with what I was saying. Other friends had questions. In the middle of a really dingy karaoke bar, really loud, I was speaking about Jesus and the gospel. And then the conversation tapers off, doesn't it? We moved to someplace else. And then somebody else brought up the conversation again. I was ready to get out of that. I was ready to leave. I was ready to go. Somebody else brought it up. I had to go back in. We are starting to talk about what Jesus said about um, suffering and what it means in the world. Instead of having pints and talking about the gospel at work, we were talking about Jesus. We are talking about the Bible. This other friend starts fighting back. It starts to get quite heated the bed. We leave that place, we carry on walking down the road, and we're still talking about Jesus. Now, I know some of those friends to this day, and some of them I don't, they've gone on the wrong way, but in all that took was a guy that was fear and trembling in the most awkward place that you can imagine, just a normal, regular space, to pray, to have the courage to tell people about Jesus clearly. That's true of every one of us here, guys. That's not special people, that's just you. Every one of us here can obey this teaching as a church. You know what the good news is? Is when somebody that you know actually wants to be interested in Jesus, it, it gives you fuel. It feeds your life. It creates more courage in you. And when you have that experience and you go around and telling people in your church, it encourages them. It's not some far away church that's special and big and massive and razzmatazz that can do this. It's just a small church, a small people, where a guy going to a hairdresser's, having a conversation with his hairdresser that he wasn't expecting. That's where this gets put into practice. The only other thing I want to say, um, just to get my notes, it's just that not only is it hard, it's hard over a long period of time. And you need to have courage to do that. Now, some of you here in this room, I know, have friends and family that are, are not Christians, that you're praying for and you want to know the Lord. Uh, some of you know my story. You know that my father is in hospital now. He's on the end of his life. He's close, very close to the end now. And we're spending a lot of time here. All my life, I've been praying for my dad. I live, my dad and I have not had a good relationship for all sorts of reasons I'm not going to know. It's been really hard. But I get to spend a little time with him now. And I bought him the Bible last year, hoping he'd read it. Of course he didn't. Went to the shelf somewhere, never read it. I've tried to segue into a conversation with Jesus, not interested. I tried doing the bold thing in my head, I pray to you, Lord, not interested. Praying for the power, didn't happen. But now that he's at the end of his life, in this very moment, 
I found that if I say to him, Dad, do you want to open up the Bible and read it? He says, yes. I'm holding his hand. I'm praying with him. I'm opening up the Bible and I'm reading it. And he's listening. He's saying amen to it. It's taken me 40 years. 40 years of keeping going. And I tell you right now, as many times I wanted to give up. Many times. But for that one person, it means everything that you have the courage to keep going, to keep letting them know. They need you to be courageous in mission, not give up. I'm going to take a moment in silence right now so you can remember some of the people that you feel like the Lord might be prompting you this morning to go and be courageous. And I'll, um, uh, then I'll end in prayer. Lord Jesus, you say that all authority has been given to you so that we do not have to worry. You teach us to go out there, not become entrenched, not to point the finger at others, not to hide from the world around us. You teach us to teach others to observe everything you've commanded, to have the strength and courage that everything you've taught is good and right, and to do that for others. And you teach us to do it together. Lord, let us be like the apostles, weak and trembling. Weak and trembling, Lord. But have faith in you that you have come that everybody might know you, Lord. Pray that everybody here this week has an opportunity when weak and trembling inside their belly to pray that you will be with them, that they may speak of your word boldly to another. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.